Hey everybody, uh, Mr. Musak back again for some more history for you guys. Uh, great job in taking your test uh, on Thursday, everybody, who was able to take it. Uh, we're going to start our next unit now. Uh, these notes we do next week, Monday, so you have Friday to take care of them, so make sure you do that if you need to, and Monday, ARP, ARP time as well. Uh, we'll start industrialization, so the idea that we're moving forward now from the west to the east, how the country becomes industrial power in the late 19th century. Uh, so first off, what does North America have? And one of the best things we figure out in the middle, in the late 19th century is that North America has all kinds of resources. Now, think about yourself, guys. What kind of valuable resources come from the earth? Probably in gold, probably in silver, like we talked about last unit. But what's really cool is that in other things too, iron, coal, oil, all those kind of things really come to the table in the late 19th century for the United States. And so not just precious metals. Uh, the United States basically goes from being very mineral poor being very, very mineral rich. Uh, so the big minerals that are involved in the industrial process, coal, oil, iron, other metals besides gold and silver, are a big deal now for us uh, in, in, in the late 19th century. West Virginia always had this very low-grade coal. It never burned uh, at the right temperature to be used in stoves and ovens and for regular blacksmithing. You see these guys here, these are their mining coal here in West Virginia. Here's the West Virginia coal mine. But late 19th century, we learn now how to, how to take this lower grade coal and use it. And now the United States goes from being very, very coal poor to being very coal rich. Uh, lots and lots of coal from West Virginia. Now also, um, it's kind of, I read a statistic where the United States in the late 19th century was the number one producer of all the major minerals except for one. That one mineral was bauxite. The French were leaders in bauxite. But our mining field in the late 19th century is huge. All right, if it matter, iron, coal, copper, lead, oil, you name it, we were leading the world in production of those minerals in the late 19th century. Now, we export some of that kind of stuff to Europe because, uh, you know, their industrial revolution started a lot sooner than ours did. They're very depleted of these resources. And so, really, Europe is taking a lot of our resources, making cheap junk, and selling it back to us. And eventually, we become the cheap junk makers later on. Uh, so, we're kind of, you know, really producing a lot of these, a lot of these resources. Uh, for Europe and also for ourselves during this time period. We also started developing our industry as well. Uh, the government kind of saw we were sending a lot of those resources to Britain. And for example, in Britain, they're sending ma the manufactured goods back to us. And so what the government does this is they put tariffs on uh, goods from other countries to help support the American businesses. A tariff is a tax on imports. How it works is that uh, the United States could produce a good bit for the same price. Uh, but, you know, Maybe Britain could produce them even cheaper. The natural forests are, natural resources are here, so it'll be better for us to actually sell our, our natural resources to our factories here in the United States, which is, say, Britain. We have a big labor force, but the problem is that, you know, Britain may pay more for our natural resources. We have a reason to make sure our natural resources stay here. So we put a tariff on, say, British goods. So here we got our example of making cloth, all right? So British cloth is $4 a roll, U.S. cloth is $4, cloth is $4 a roll. Now, we're going to make sure that if you want to buy the American good, we're going to put a 25% tariff on the British cloth. So that we are at a dollar to each British piece of cloth, and now it's costing $5 a roll here versus American-made cloth is $4 a roll. Obviously, people are going to buy the $4 roll cloth. This can work with steel, can work with all the other kind of stuff to make sure that we're buying U.S.-made goods in the U.S. So that's what a tariff is, that tax on imports. Now, we also have new inventions and uses for our natural materials. Um, in a place called Titusville, Pennsylvania, uh, 1859, Edwin L. Drake discovered oil. All of a sudden, he discovered oil coming out of the ground. And now, people all over that eastern part of the country set up oil derricks, like the one up here in this picture, in like Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Ohio, Indiana, so on and so forth. Texas was not yet a big oil state. It was visible, it was most about cows at this point versus being about oil. Now, the reason why oil was for kerosene lamps. Uh, this was a lot safer than, say, a candle, and it was easier to make. Um, but you had to take the crude oil, this really nasty, sticky, black stuff you got out of the ground, and refine it into kerosene. Now, the byproduct of kerosene was gasoline. And at that point, there was no real use for gasoline. They just threw the gasoline away, dumped it in the river, whatever it was. Obviously, total opposite today. Back then, kerosene was the main thing you wanted to have oil for, so you'd light up your houses and use it in lamps. Electricity was another big thing we figured out. Um, ben Franklin, the famous story of the key, all that kind of stuff, had harnessed electricity from lightning, but we really still couldn't use it yet. It wasn't really controlled that we could use electricity. Uh, this guy up here, Thomas Edison, we're going to talk more about him in class, was an American inventor. 
and he actually finds a way to produce, control, and distribute electricity. He finds a way to make a generator using magnets to generate electricity and then uh, distribute along wires and use it in the Edison light bulb. He, uh, you know, part of the part was that uh, in a light bulb, it's a vacuum inside and light pieces of this filament to create the light. Uh, so he makes a filament light bulb. The reason he makes this is a lot safer than kerosene lamps. One of the big problems in the cities with kerosene lamps uh, was that you tip them over, they start fires. And so this way is a much safer way to make light. What's really kind of cool is that uh, this light bulb down here in the very bottom, that is one of the oldest operating light bulbs in the world. It has been on since the very early 1900s. And that light bulb was actually made by Thomas Edison. Uh, it's in Florida where his summer home was. And that light bulb has been burning constantly in a fire station since the early 1900s. Never been turned off. In fact, they say about light bulbs that what really damages light bulbs is to turn them on and off. If you leave it on all the time, it might last forever. Now, the kind of electricity that, that Edison used was called direct current. You can kind of see it looks like it's a straight line right across the wire. Now, contrary to Edison, uh, one of his uh, former assistants, a guy named Nikola Tesla, created something called alternating current. Uh, he decided alternating current was that the current would kind of like jump up and down, or kind of like go high, low, high, low, high, low, all the way across the wire in kind of cycle. He did this so it would be, one, safer, less chance of electrocution, and two, it would travel much further distances, making it much cheaper. With direct current from Edison here, you had to have a generator in your basement to power the lights for you. For Tesla's alternating current, uh, you could you know, have a power station like, like we do today uh, in one spot and send electricity out from there. So really there's a big electricity debate. What do you use? Do you use AC, alternating current, or do you use DC, direct current? One way is that Nikola Tesla, who was funded by an uh, inventor named George Westinghouse, one way is he tried to prove the safety of electric current was these things down here. This is a Tesla coil, essentially big sparks that arced across uh, from two uh, basically metal, metal conductors. And here you see the picture. This is Tesla reading in this room as these Tesla coils uh, spark uh, across. In fact, he would actually get up on stages and have electricity pass through his body from Tesla coil to Tesla coil to prove that his alternating current was safer. Now let's create a big debate because whoever decided to do this would make tons of money off their invention. So it was a big debate. They have AC versus DC as we have the logo up here for ACDC. Um, so we're trying to figure out which kind of electricity you use best. And so both Tesla and Edison kind of compete with each other. You know, the, the former uh, teacher to the student kind of compete with each other uh, to figure out which one's best. And one of the ways they tested it was to show how unsafe alternating current was. And that was actually used it for executions. Uh, the first electric chair was made uh, in New York at Sing Sing Prison, and they used it to execute a prisoner using alternating current to show it, it, how unsafe it was. They also actually execute an elephant the same way uh, to prove how unsafe it was. Uh, her name was Tops the Elephant. She had gone crazy and uh, stampeded through a circus and killed the, uh, the handlers. And it's also executed here by a electrician as well to show how dangerous it was. In the end, Westinghouse and, and Tesla's alternating current won out. And now the alternating current we get out of the outlets in your house today or in your classroom today are using alternating current. And as we start using alternating current to power all these electronic devices, streetcars, electric motors like these right here for machines and factories, we start using um, something else. I'm trying to think. Oh, electric lights uh, in town. So street lights are being created. All those things are a big deal. In fact, when the century turned, 1900, the big deal in New York City were colored electric lights that year decorating the streets. Now, electric motors were a big part of this, though, because now you could build your factory much further away from water. Before this, they are all water-powered. Now you could use uh, electricity running through a wire to power your motors in, the, in your, your factory. The telephone was another big way of making change now. Um, this guy over here is uh, Alexander Graham Bell, and so he'll be in your notes. So Alexander Graham Bell is right here, and he was a guy who basically invented the idea of the telephone in 1876. Uh, he was a teacher for the deaf, is what, is what Alexander Graham Bell was. And he wanted to try and find a way to better send speech uh, through electronic signals. Really inspired by the idea of the telegraph where you send the kind of tap out signals across the one line. So he invented a way that you would speak in here, it would shake carbon grains against a magnet, turn that, that, sh that speech into electronic, uh, electronic um, impulses, send all the way through here, shake another little thing, and it comes out in speech. So his first uh, message was uh, passed in 1876 to his assistant, Mr. Watson. Mr. Watson, come here, I need you. Uh, so he sent that 
by, by a telephone through his house. Now, each of the inventors had to develop a patent for these. And a patent is just a, uh, a government document that says, I own the rights to this invention, and I should get all royalties from it. Uh, Edison had tons of inventions. We'll talk about that in class. Uh, Graham Bell, the exact same thing. He worked on metal detectors and er, on early iron lung, those kind of creations. Now, one of the big things we find is steel. Now, iron versus steel, what's the difference? Iron is very hard and heavy, but it's brittle because iron is impure. Steel is basically a pure way, of, a pure form of iron. It's harder, lighter, but stronger and more flexible. So it can, if it gets pressures, it's going to bend versus breaking. Also, steel does not rust. The original way of making it was called puddling, where you had this big puddle of molten iron and you just sift off the impurities from the very, very top. It was very labor intensive, very hard to do. So we found a better way of making steel, and that's called the Bessemer process. It was done in Britain, and the ideas were brought here, kind of illegally in a way, if you will. But basically, you have your big, huge uh, molten pot of stuff here, of iron here, and you inject air and carbon into uh, this, this steel. And it gets rid of the impurities and makes a much purer steel. And to do that, you use a special kind of coal called coke that was found uh, in West Virginia. It burned hotter, it burned better, I mean, change that, uh, and it made a much purer steel. The best part about this was that you could make the, take the puddling out, and so now that skill wasn't needed to make steel anymore. You can make quicker, faster, better steel uh, for different machines and those kind of things. Our railroads are a big part of this too. Uh, as railroads are growing, as we talked about last, last hour, uh, last unit, they're growing. By 1890, here's what the railroad map looks like in the United States by 1890. It allows those natural resources that are found out here on the mines to get to the industrial factories of the east, and then vice versa. I mean, they can, these trains carry tons of materials and move over 40 miles an hour. I mean, after the Civil War, they make, you know, after the Civil War, there are only 30,000 miles of railroad, and by 1890, 180,000 miles of railroad. That shows you just how much railroads were built during this time. Now, granted, railroads were still a very dangerous job. They, uh, trains could derail, they could explode. Uh, working on the trains was very dangerous. It's very easy to get crushed or run over. Um, so it was a very, very dangerous job, but it was a way that they got goods across the country at this time. And they invent something called railroad time. Uh, we go, you, they used to use um, solar time. So I, I, every community had their own time period. At noon, everyone set their watches, and it was set. They tried what was called standard railway time, basically the creation of time zones. So why that's why TV channels and games and athletic contests are different times based off of where they're being played. We're in the central time zone, obviously, okay? So they made four time zones across the United States because the railroads traveling to make sure that uh, the time would be right when you got there. And so instead of being solar time every other place, make sure the schedules ran exactly right, they made our new standard time. So your eastern time zone, central time zone, mountain, western time zones they create for the railroads, essentially. Last little thing we'll look at is how railroad travel in in increased as well. Again, George Pullman made the Pullman car, basically uh, cars to carry people in luxury, even cars you could sleep on as you travel across country. And so they made these big, nice uh, railroad cars. They're used everybody from peasants to presidents use these George Pullman cars. And he also created these big company towns to make his cars. So he would put his big factory in the middle of town and then basically own all the houses, all the stores, all those kind of things around it so that he could, one, make money off of it, and two, provide for the, the workers in his factories. I mean, everybody was basically run by Pullman. The housing, the food, the doctors, etc. Very, very tightly controlled. So in a way, that's kind of not fair because in the end, Pullman's making all the money, but also allowed for much better production of the goods uh, of his of railroad cars and those kind of things. Think about the impacts of industrialization, guys. Oil, all of a sudden we have lights. Eventually we have cars. Eventually we have diesel engines down the, down the road. All those things play a big role there. Steel, make better ships, better railroads, better skyscrapers. Steel makes us grow. Electricity. Provides light, provides safety, better engines, better factories. All because of the goods we have and the things we can make during this time period. We'll talk more about inventions in class. We're going to be researching some inventions in class as well. The impact they had. We compare them to things like Edison, those kind of people. Uh, we'll, we'll analyze that on uh, Friday and Monday in class. These notes are due Monday, guys. So I have another set due Tuesday. They'll be handing out on Friday. Sorry for the uh, kind of a lot of notes, but uh, you'll, you'll be okay. Thanks a lot, guys. See you in class.